Hello there. How's your day? I hope it was productive and good. Tonight, I would like to read another chapter from this awesome book. No wonder they call him the Savior by Max Lucado. And it's a book, as I said yesterday, that uh, presents the Chronicles of the Cross. And um, this is a very special chapter because it presents a challenge to us not to leave things undone, especially when it comes to our decisions in our relationship with God. Well, almost. Almost is a sad word in any man's dictionary. Almost. It runs hard with nearly, next time, if only, and just about. It's a word that smacks off missed opportunities, aborted efforts, and fumbled chances. It's honorable mention, right field, on the bench, runner-up, and burnt cookies. Almost. The one that got away. The sale that nearly closed. The gamble that almost paid off. Almost. How many people do you know whose claim to fame is in... Almost? Did I ever tell you about the time I almost was selected as the employee of the year? They say he almost made it to the big leagues. I caught a fish that was taller than me. Well, almost. As long as there have been people, there have been almosts. People who almost won the battle, who almost climbed the mountain, who almost found the treasure. One of the most famous almosts is found in the Bible. Pilate. Yet, what he missed was far more significant than a cat, catfish or an award. He almost performed what would have been history's greatest act of mercy. He almost pardoned the Prince of Peace. He almost released the Son of God. He almost op opted to acquit the Christ. Almost. He had the power. He had the choice. He wore the signet ring. The option to free God's son was his. And he did it. Almost. Almost. How many times do these six ugly letters find their way into despairing epitaphs? He almost got it together. She almost chose not to leave him. They almost tried one more time. We almost worked it out. He almost became a Christian. What is it that makes almost such a potent word? Why is there such a wide gap between he almost and he did? In the case of Pilate, we don't have to look far to find an answer. It is Dr. Luke's acute commentary in chapter 23 that proves the reason. Let's tune in at verse 22. A third time, he, Pilate, said to them, the crowd, Why? What evil has he done? I have found him, in him no crime deserving death. I will therefore chastise him and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with the loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. You're right, Luke. Their voices prevailed. And as a result, Pilate's pride prevailed. Pilate's fear prevailed. Pilate's power hunger prevailed. Their voices were not the only voices, you know. There were at least three other voices Pilate could have heard. He could have heard the voice of Jesus. Pilate stood eye to eye with him. Five times he postponed the decision, hoping to gratify the mob with policies or lashings. Yet, Jesus was always sent back to him. Three times he stood eye to eye with this compelling Nazarene who had come to reveal the truth. What is truth? Pilate asked rhetorically. Or was it honestly? Jesus' silence was much louder than the crowd's demands, but Pilate didn't listen. He could have heard the voice of his wife. She pleaded with him to have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much over him today in a dream. One has to pause and wonder about the origin of such a dream that would cause a lady of purple to call a small town Galilee righteous. But Pilate didn't. Or he could have heard his own voice. Surely he could, have, he could see through the facade. Ananias and Caiaphas, cut the phony allegiance, you slobs. I know where your interests are. Surely 
his conscience was speaking to him, there's nothing wrong with this man. A bit mysterious maybe, but there's no reason to string him up. He could have heard other voices, but he didn't. He almost did, but he didn't. Satan voices prevailed. His voice often does prevail. Have you heard his wings? One time won't hurt. She'll never know. Other people do much worse things. At least you're not being hypocritical. His rhetoric of rationalization never ends. The father of lies croons and woos like a traveling peddler, promising the moon and delivering disaster. Step right up. Taste my brew of pleasure and sing my song of sensuality. After all, who knows about tomorrow? God, meanwhile, never enters a shouting match with Satan. Truth need not scream. He stands permanently, quietly pleading, pleading ever present. No tricks, no side shows, no temptations, just open proof. People's reactions vary. Some flow immediately to the peddlers of poison. Others turn quickly to the Prince of Peace. Most of us, however, are caught somewhere in between, lingering on the edge of Satan's crowd, yet hovering with, within earshot of the message of God. Pilate learned the hard way that this stance of almost is suicidal. The other voices will win. Their lure is too strong. Their call is too compelling. And Pilate also learned that there is no darker hell than the one of remorse. Washing your hands a thousand times won't free you from the guilt of an opportunity ignored. It is one thing to forgive yourself for something you did. It is something else to try to forgive yourself for something that you might have done but didn't. Jesus knew that all along. For our own good, he demanded and demands absolute obedience. He never has had room for almost in his vocabulary. You're either with him or against him. With Jesus, nearly has to become certainly. Sometimes has to become always. If only has to become regardless. And next time has to become this time. No. Jesus never had room for almost, and he still doesn't. Almost may count in horseshoes and hand grenades, but with a master, it is just as good as never. I don't know how you're making decisions lately, and I don't know if at this point you, you feel close but not quite to him. I don't know if, if you have almost given him your heart, but still there's things that you're still holding on to. So tonight I would like to pray that you will give yourself completely to the Lord. That that almost will be complete surrender. That that sometimes will become always. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, before we go to bed, after having a productive day, we want to thank you for your goodness and for your patience and for your love and for the opportunity you've given us tonight to reconsider our position, to reevaluate our actions and, and our decisions, whatever is happening inside our hearts. So please, Lord, help us to give ourselves completely to you. We surrender all. May your hearts have peace, knowing that we made the right decision. May we not regret missing this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, have a good night.